Well, the more I think about it, the more I realize that in choosing to speak this year on loving Jesus more, I have set before us a daunting challenge. Part of that challenge is personal, and it's really a challenge for all of us. Will we really grow more and more in love with Jesus? How disappointing it would be to get to the end of the year and uh, discover that that hadn't really happened in our lives. So that's a personal challenge. But there's also a challenge in the subject matter itself. A.W. Tozer once wrote, all Christians have tried to explain God's love, but none has ever done it very well. So don't expect too much from this year's chapel series. That's part of the takeaway. But Tozer goes on to say this, for our encouragement, I can no more do justice to that awesome and wonder-filled theme than a child can grasp a star. But still, by reaching towards the star, the child may call attention to it and even indicate the direction in which one must look to see it. And so as I stretch out my heart toward the high, shining love of God, Someone who has not before known about it may be encouraged to look up and have hope. This is what A.W. Tozer says, as we consider God's love together, we are reaching for the stars. But even if we are not able to grasp how wide and how high and how long and how deep is the love of Christ, at least we can point towards it and say, see, there it is, the love of God in Christ. Now, I have given my series, I think, maybe the simplest title I could, Love Jesus More. But as I reflect on that title, I realize it presupposes another problem. If we say that we want to love Jesus more or that we ought to love him more, whether we really want that or not, then we're admitting that we don't love Jesus as well as we should. If you think about it logically, the only people who can love Jesus more are people who love Jesus less. And it's true for all of us. Our love is limited, not just for one another, but also for Jesus himself. And when we open the scriptures, we discover that we are not alone in that, and maybe that in itself is encouraging. The failure of the people of God to love their God is one of the most pervasive themes in the story of salvation. We see it, for example, all the way through the Old Testament. The story of the children of Israel is really a, a love story. God has a heart full of love for his people and he proves that love over and over and over again. I, I have loved you with an everlasting love, he says. Therefore, I have continued my faithfulness to you. And the children of Israel were called to respond to that infinite, everlasting love with a, a love for God in return. And every day, devout believers would confess their love for God with heart and soul and strength. And yet over and over again, they failed to live up to that promise. They turned their hearts against God. And so one of the ways that God confronted that failure in the pages of Scripture is by styling himself as a wounded lover. His passion smolders on the pages of the Old Testament. And how often he describes his romance with his people as a kind of spiritual marriage. And when their hearts grew cold, therefore, it was the ultimate betrayal. Maybe you've noticed that the imagery that the Old Testament uses to describe that marital breakdown is, is shocking. On occasion, God compares Israel to a groom who cheats on his wife, or to a virgin who becomes a prostitute. In the early pages of Jeremiah, God actually files for divorce on the grounds of spiritual adultery. But he never betrays his love for his people. He never goes back on his covenant. Now his love is like the love of Hosea, the prophet who was called to return to a wayward woman and take her again to be his wife. Really, you see the same struggle in the New Testament, the followers of Christ often falling out of love. When Jesus warned his disciples that the hearts of many would grow cold, he knew what he was talking about. That first generation of the church was the first generation to love Jesus less. 
And already by the end of the New Testament, in his revelation letter to the Ephesians, John was warning the first Christians that they had forsaken their first love, the kind of first love that we were inviting the Spirit to awaken within us as we sang together this morning. And I think it's important to notice that the people who struggle truly to love God are the very people who have directly experienced the most of his blessings. Think of the children of Israel and all the reasons that they had to love God. He had delivered them from slavery. He had conquered their enemies. He had established their kingdom. Yet even in a land flowing with milk and honey, they fell out of love with God. Or think of those Ephesians, a church planted by the Apostle Paul, pastored by, by gifted young Timothy, at the end of his life and ministry, nurtured by John, the evangelist of God's love, and yet that church succumbed to spiritual entropy. Their hearts grew cold. I wonder, could it happen to us with all of the blessings that we have received? I mean, really, is there a college anywhere that has been as blessed by God as Wheaton College? But now ask yourself, what has happened to my love for Jesus? Maybe you're finding you're falling more and more in love with him all the time. I love the uh, way that Jerry Truesdell expresses this truth. He has written a book called Miraculous Movements. It's about the work of God in the Muslim world. And he gave the, uh, the, his book the following subtitle, and it, it gave my heart a lift as I read the subtitle. You, you don't always find that in subtitles to books, but his subtitle was how hundreds of thousands of Muslims are falling in love with Jesus. What a marvelous way to describe what it means to be a Christian. It's a, it's a romance. Drizzle tells, for example, in his account of people who grew up reading the Quran and eventually fell in love with Jesus, he tells the story of a man he calls Zamil, a successful businessman, a prominent citizen, a leader in his local mosque. One night, Jesus appeared to Zamil in a dream and said that he was the light of the world. Zamil was so blinded by that light, it was like the apostle Paul when he awoke, he was unable to see. Soon he came into contact with other Christians. They read to him from the scriptures. He, he heard the gospel. He gave his heart to Jesus. And naturally, he prayed that God would restore his sight. But God did not answer that prayer. Maybe worse, his family disowned and dispossessed him. And yet the Holy Spirit gave Zamil such a passionate love for Jesus that he couldn't keep the gospel to himself. He went to nearby villages. He started preaching. And when Truesdale met him just two years later, he was busy, this blind evangelist. He was already planting his eighth church. When we are truly in love with Jesus, we will overcome any obstacle to advance his kingdom. And maybe that's your experience your testimony this morning, a testimony of falling more and more in love with Jesus. And yet how easy it is for our affections to move in the opposite direction. We look back, we, we realize that there was a time when we were more in love with Jesus than we are now. Maybe when we first came to Christ and we were so grateful to receive eternal life that, that Jesus was the only object of our affection. Or maybe we felt more this way later on. God healed us or helped us or rescued us or provided for us, and we could only respond with loving gratitude. Our hearts were moved with worship. We were so humbled by the gifts that we had received that it was only natural for us to say, I love you, Jesus, for, for loving me the way that you do. And yet that season has passed. And now your life is filled with so many other affections, all of the other things that you say that you love, that there is so little room left for Jesus. I don't know what these things are. They may be good things in themselves. They may be small, apparently trivial things, but they get in the way of loving Jesus. The beverage of your choice, you may say you love that. Your favorite prof, your hometown team, 
the latest video game. I mean, you could come up with a long list of things that you are loving in your life right now. And you still love Jesus, at least to some extent, but maybe he's like the old backpack that you're comfortable with, but not that excited about. Or maybe, I don't know if this analogy works for you, try it. Maybe it's like the crush you had at the beginning of freshman year, and now you're not sure why. And if you're totally honest, you have to admit it spiritually, you love Jesus less. If you're not content with that, and actually deep down you want to love Jesus more, I think it's very important to understand how you receive that love. It's not simply by sitting there and saying, mm, I love Jesus more now. It's by understanding the work of God in the life of the soul. I wanna ask the question and try to answer it this morning. What is the channel for receiving the love that enables you to grow in your love for Jesus? In one sense, the answer to that is obvious, so obvious. We know that God is love and that we love because he first loved us. So of course, God is the channel of that love, including our love for God himself. But I wanna be more specific. Let me invite you to turn in your Bibles to Romans chapter five. It's just a single verse that I wanna to call to our attention this morning, Romans chapter five. The beginning of Romans five, Paul says something very significant about the love of God and how we get that love. He's spelling out the implications of our justification, that by faith in Christ, we stand righteous before God and have confidence to face the coming judgment. And part of the proof of that is our present experience of the love of God. And in, in a little bit later in the chapter, Paul will go on to explain that that love of God is the love of Calvary. It's the love Christ showed to us when we were still sinners by dying for us on the cross. Now notice what is said in verse five. God's love has been poured into our hearts through the Holy Spirit who has been given to us. How appropriate it was at the beginning of our worship this morning to invite the presence of the Holy Spirit. At the end of our service, chapel band will come back up and we'll, we'll pray for the work of the Spirit within us. But this is the channel of the love of God, the, the love that we have within us, the love poured into our hearts. How do we receive that? We receive it through the third person of the Trinity, this Holy Spirit given to us by God. Whatever love we have within us was put there by the Spirit of God. People sometimes wonder exactly what the Spirit does. We, we know who the Father is, we have a sense of that. Most of us have fathers of our own or we've seen other fathers in action. We know the Son because he's really the, the focus of the scriptures. It's his story that we read in the Gospels. But who is the Holy Spirit? What does he do? Jonathan Edwards said, it is the Spirit's office to communicate divine love to the creature. The Spirit's the one putting God's love into our hearts. And when the Spirit does this, Edward says, God's love doth but communicate of itself. In other words, in giving us the Holy Spirit, God has given us his own love. Consider how amazing that is and also how necessary. God does not expect us to love him simply with our own puny affection, so feeble and so fickle, but instead invites us to love him back with the love that he gives. God is so generous with his affections that we have enough left over to use for loving him and loving other people. William Temple, who served as the Archbishop of Canterbury during World War II, illustrated the work of the Holy Spirit by drawing an analogy to William Shakespeare. He said, it is no good giving me a play like Hamlet or King Lear and telling me to write a play like that. Shakespeare could do it, I can't. And it's no good showing me to live a life like the life of Jesus and telling me to, to live a life like that. Jesus could do it, but I can't. But if 
the genius of Shakespeare could come and live in me, then I could write plays like his. And if the Holy Spirit could come into me, then I could live a life like Jesus. This is what the Holy Spirit does to empower us with Christ-like love. He comes right inside us. And once he is there, he fills us with the love of God. If we are able to look into our hearts and see even a small measure of true love for Jesus, this can only be the work of God the Holy Spirit. Now this assumes, of course, that we have the Spirit to begin with. And I ask you this morning to examine your heart and ask whether you have truly received the Holy Spirit. Do you have the Spirit of God in your life? Have you experienced His regenerating power? Or to put it in the terms that Jesus put it in His conversation on the Holy Spirit with Nicodemus, are you born again by the Spirit's power? The unmistakable sign of the Spirit's presence in our lives is faith in Jesus. This is what the Holy Spirit has been given to you to do principally, give you faith and love for Jesus Christ. Listen to the way that one former imam testified to the Spirit's power. This is another story that Jerry Truesdell tells in his book. It started with a conversation the man had with his grandfather who was also an imam, a a Muslim teacher. And they were discussing the death of Muhammad According to the Quran, when Muhammad was dying, his daughter Fatima said, Father, you are dying, but where are you going from here? And what will happen to us? All Muhammad could say in response was, ask me anything from my wealth, but I cannot save you from Allah's punishment. And then he said, by Allah, though I am the apostle of Allah, yet I do not know what Allah will do to me. You see, the prophet, this is there in the Quran, the prophet himself was uncertain of receiving mercy. Well, the imam remembered of this conversation later when he was reading the New Testament. A Christian missionary had challenged him to read the Gospel of John, and he was eager to do that so he could find the mistakes and then point them out to the missionary. As he was reading, he encountered the words of Jesus in John 14, I am going to the Father. I go to prepare a place for you, and if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you to myself, that where I I am, you may be also. And where I go, you know, and the way, you know. Well, immediately when the man read those words, he ran to his grandfather and asked him to repeat the dying words of Muhammad. And after his grandfather recited the Quran, the man said, Grandfather, look at Jesus. He was going to his father and would prepare a place for his followers. And after that, he will come back. But Muhammad doesn't know where he is going. So he challenged his grandfather, which one would you follow? Well, for his own part, that imam started to follow Jesus. By the power of the Holy Spirit, he was falling in love with a Savior who actually knows where he is going and has promised to take us there with him. This is the Spirit that we need in our lives. Understand, once you have the Holy Spirit, he may not call all that much attention to himself. The Spirit has such a strong desire to show you the Son that he is almost shy. In a way, this is maybe true of each person of the Trinity. They're always directing attention to one another. The Father wants to glorify His beloved Son. The Son seeks to honor the Father. And and when the Son promised to send the Spirit, He boasted that the Spirit would enable us to do even greater works than He had done. The Father and the Son and the Spirit, they are always giving one another the glory. And so the Spirit may seem rather shy, but Even if he does not call much attention to himself, he is unmistakably there. Whenever you are convinced of the truth of God's word, or convicted of sin, or believe that Jesus is the Christ, or are motivated to worship, or empowered to serve, the the Spirit is at work in all of these things. And we know for sure that he is at work whenever we love Jesus, because he is the channel for God's love. Now, the way I want to apply this is by reminding you this morning how important it is to leave your life totally open to the Spirit's influence. 
If you want to love Jesus more, it's not simply a matter of saying that you want to love Jesus more, it's partly doing everything you can to open the channel of his love, which is the work of the Holy Spirit. And the Bible gives some very specific instructions about our response to the Spirit. It, it tells us some things that we should be sure to do and also some things we should be very careful not to do. On the positive side, we are told to walk with the Spirit, to keep in step with the Spirit. It principally means following the words the Spirit has revealed in Scripture, but it also means following His leading through His inward work in the mind and the heart and the conscience. When the Spirit speaks, be ready to listen. Learn to be attentive to His voice. Not necessarily as an audible word, although if the Spirit wants to speak that way, that's up to Him. Not necessarily as some infallible indicator for daily decision making. I mean, don't go around saying all the time, God told me to do this, or worse, God told me to tell you to do this. But respond to his voice as the gentle guide constantly drawing you into the life of Jesus, true spiritual life. The Spirit will prompt you to pray. You'll have the thought, we should pray about this. And when the Spirit prompts you in that way, then pray. When the Spirit gives you some impulse to share your faith and go ahead and give someone the gospel. Believers who faithfully follow that inward leading of the Holy Spirit grow dynamically and work effectively for the kingdom of God. They always do. The Spirit wants to lead you deeper and deeper into that life. You have to respond to his promptings. On the negative side, the Bible tells us explicitly not to quench or to grieve the Holy Spirit of God. We quench the Spirit. This is in, at the end of 1 Thessalonians chapter 5. We quench the Spirit when we sense Him leading us to do something and then fail to follow through. We, we know that we should pray, but it seems like too much work and we skip it instead. Our conscience is troubled by sin, but we never actually tell Jesus that we're sorry. We sense an opportunity to share the gospel, but we're really not sure what to say. We change the subject to something trivial. These are all ways of quenching the spirit. It's also possible to grieve the spirit, which we do whenever we persist in rebellious sin. He is, after all, a Holy Spirit, and so as He lives within us, He wants us to be holy, and He's grieved when we are unholy. I think it's significant, the context in which the Bible tells us not to grieve the Holy Spirit. It's Ephesians chapter 4, and the context there is, has to do with sins of speech. I wonder if that's the connection that we would first think of, but it's the connection the Bible makes. Let no corrupting talk come out of your mouths. The scripture says, let all slander be put away from you, along with all malice, bad language, hateful speech, words that tear people down. These things grieve the Spirit of God, and not just if they are spoken out loud, even if they are only spoken inwardly in the dialogue of the soul. These things are things that grieve the Holy Spirit. And could it be, as we think about what it means to quench or to grieve the Holy Spirit, that this may help us understand why we are not falling more in love with Jesus than we are? Because when we do not turn to God in prayer or encourage other people with the gospel, we are quenching the Spirit. When we curse God or speak against others, we are grieving the Spirit. And does it not make sense then that in some way we are choking off the channel of God's love within us? I mention this to encourage God's full work in your life so that you would not quench or grieve the Holy Spirit, but that you would open your heart fully to his love. And let me say there is still hope for us because God never gives up on us. How amazingly gracious it is that he has given us his spirit, the spirit that even at this moment is striving within you to grow you in the love of God. God knows that we are not very good lovers. And so by his spirit, he has poured his infinite love into our hearts. Let me close my remarks with a simple illustration to show how this works. A couple of years ago, when our son Jack was 10, he 
went to Honey Rock Camp for his, part of his summer experience, and when he came back home, he amazed us, actually, by presenting each one of us a gift, all six members of his family. There was a gift for all of us. Each gift had been made at the craft shop. Each gift was unique. Each one was carefully chosen to be appropriate for the recipient. I mean, that's a lot for a 10-year-old boy, let me tell you. A canoe paddle to hang on the wall, a hot plate for the kitchen, the pencil holder, very nice, that's on my dresser at home. When I asked Jack how he had managed to get all of the materials to make all of these gifts, he told me that he had paid for his supplies with money from his camp account. And suddenly I realized I was the major financial investor in Jack's craft-making, gift-giving enterprise. But that did not diminish the heartwarming expression of his love for his mother and father, his brother and his sisters. So it is with the loving worship and heartfelt service that we offer to Jesus. God has put his love into your hearts by pouring the Holy Spirit into your life. And so when we desire to love Jesus more, we are not limited to loving him with our own small affection, but we have been given the abundant love of God. It's with that love that we love him in return. Let me invite the chapel band to come forward. Our closing song is really a prayer for the work of the Holy Spirit in our lives. Let's stand for that before the song and closing benediction.
Holy Spirit, fill your life with more and more and more of the love of Jesus. Amen. <laughs>